This is our first year doing the challenge. So we appreciate you guys working with us um, to make this a success. And we're just really looking forward to all the creative ideas that you guys have. You know, this challenge was actually started when we went to a company and asked them to improve one of the pieces of equipment that we currently make. We wanted them to make it faster, lighter, cheaper to produce. And what they came back to us was get a bunch of high schoolers to do it. So that's why we're here. We have um, solutions that we're currently making. We want you to make them better and make them smarter through the use of Internet of Things technology. So a few housekeeping items. Um, that we are using high five here. So please mute your line. You can ask questions throughout the entire thing through the group chat button, which is down there in the middle. And we'll be answering your questions um, during the presentation, um, through the scenarios, as well as at the very end, where we'll catch everything that we haven't during the time. Um, this session will also be recorded so that you can refer to it tomorrow or in the future. And please don't share your screen. Um, that's for us to give you information. So the agenda for today's kickoff, we're going to talk about Southwest Human Development and the Adapt Shop. You need to know who you're helping. I'll give you some information about assistive technology. The players involved in making this challenge possible, including the judges, the, the committee, and the high schools that are here. We're going to introduce you to Nathaniel and Nicole, who have gone to our adapt shop and received assistive equipment to help them. So you'll get to hear their story. That'll probably be the best part of this entire presentation. Um, we'll also go over the timeline, weeks one through four, leading up to the final day of judging on October 13th. We'll have our specialists, Matt Levac and Janice Herman, talk through the challenge scenarios. Um, that'll be really rewarding, and that's really the best time for you guys to be asking questions specific about those challenges and scenarios. We'll go over briefly the judging rubric and then catch any questions at the end. So, Southwest Human Development. Um, we are Arizona's largest early childhood nonprofit. We've been in operation for 36 years. We serve 135,000 children and families every year. And the big thing we do is we work with parents with young kids. So we're focusing on young children, zero to five, and we have over 40 programs to assist them. And the reason for that is those early years in life are really where the majority of development happens. And we wanna make sure that every child has the opportunity to have a positive future. As one of our programs, we have an assistive technology department, and that is something that's going to help people with disabilities achieve success and inclusion um, throughout their life. So assistive technology is um, a really interesting field and can definitely benefit from the maker movement um, in big ways. Um, and you know, a lot of people don't haven't heard of assistive technology or don't know what it is, but it, it's really something that we're all using every day. It's anything that's going to help you live your life to the fullest. So I wear contacts. That's assistive technology. Um, but another way to think about it is if you go to the grocery store and you're coming home with too many bags, um, how are you going to get those into the house? You've got a bunch of different ways. You can try to load yourself up and carry them in. You can take multiple trips or you could use a cart. You could use a wagon. That wagon then qualifies as assistive technology because it is a piece of equipment that's helping you um, achieve your goals and your tasks. So sometimes assistive technology is really complicated. Other times it's quite simple um, in the right hands, of course. So uh, the child you see on the screen here, this is Baraglio. And you know he came to us and his the equipment, that off-the-shelf equipment, wasn't going to work for him. So if you see the slide on the left, um, those arm supports were not efficient. So after doing the work that we did with Janice's help and physical therapist, we actually made a walker out of PVC pipe. You know, pretty simple solution to a complex problem um, when you have the right hands. 
And on this slide, you can see a lot of the more complex equipment that we'll produce. So we are using CNC machines, 3D printers, laser cutters, um, all of these under the guidance of a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, um, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of these young children. So before we get into the sponsors, I definitely want to give a big thank you to Insight. They came on uh, almost a year and a half ago and saw the vision of this event. They became the title sponsor. They also lent us some of their top-notch talent in Kirk Cornum, who is their VP of Global Transformation. And he's really been a driving force in making this challenge. He also sits on the Arizona SciTech Council's um, IoT committee. He chairs that. And he's been a great resource. So before we move on, I definitely wanted to make sure that it's really clear that Insight is one of the big reasons that this is happening, and we're very thankful for them. Some of the other sponsors that we have are Tufta Needle, WebPT, CopperPoint, CBiz, MHM, and then uh, our committee members who have also helped with the challenge, uh, Matt Levac from Excel Schools, and also Jennifer Blaine Christian from ASU. And so these are three of the judges that are going to be evaluating your work on October 13th. Um, Matt, who we just mentioned, Janice, who works here at Southwest Human Development, you'll get a chance to hear from both of them here in just a few minutes. And then obviously Kurt Kernum, who could not be with us here today. And then the competing teams, we currently have eight teams, and these are all teams with quite a bit of experience in the robotics and STEM fields. Um, you can see their names there, so that's who you're up against. So um, you got some tough competition, so we're really looking forward to seeing um, what you guys can come up with. So this will be probably the best part um, of this day. Um, we've asked Nathaniel and Nicole to come and share a little bit about um, how our services have assisted them. And this is important because this is an example of hopefully the solutions you come up with will be able to implement uh, for young children like Nathaniel. So I appreciate uh, Nathaniel and Nicole to come up and uh, share about their story. Position. Yep, you're good. Okay, hi. Um, my name's Nicole, and this is Nathaniel. Um, we've gotten help from Southwest Development and the Adapt Shop. Um, Nathaniel here actually has used the Happy Chair. Um, Nathaniel was actually born at a pound an ounce when I had him. We had complications during pregnancy. He's, you know, he's two years old. He just turned two years old today. He um, was in the hospital for about eight months. Um, he came out of the hospital with oxygen, and being in the hospital for so long, he didn't get a lot of developmental help, and you know, he just had issues, developmental delays since he was born. So we've had help with the adapt shot. They provided us with the actual happy chair that I guess you guys are going to help make improvements to. It really assisted him in um, developing strength in his abdomen and everything just to give him the extra support he needed to help him um, with sitting properly and as of right now he is sitting on his own without any assistance um, another thing that we we received from the adopt shop is the gate trainer we're actually trying to help Nathaniel learn how to walk right now and without these services and without people who were willing to take time to create these um, I guess the happy chair or the gate trainer, you know, I don't know how we could have helped Nathaniel and getting him to where he needed to get to today. But I mean, he's come a long way and we're definitely grateful for all the assistance that we've gotten from the adapt shop and um, not sure what else <laughs> to talk about with him, but that's I'm great. Excited for this. Well, thank you, Nicole and Nathaniel for coming in and helping us. All right, so uh, next we're gonna dive straight into the scenarios. Um, first, I'd like to introduce to you 
none other than Janice Herman. Hello. And also Matt Levac. We didn't have their pictures because now you can see their smiling faces in person. So they're going to introduce themselves real quickly, um, maybe just to touch on your guys' credentials, and then we'll um, start slip, flipping through the slides and answering your guys' questions. Well, I'm a physical therapist, and I've been doing assistive technology as a specialty for the last, oh, 30 years. Uh, and I really enjoy working on this team at the ADAPT shop. My role is to evaluate the child and figure out what we can do with what abilities they have and how we can supplement that with some device to help them accomplish functional things like sitting up so they can swallow or breathe or reach out. If a child in the developmental early years doesn't have the option of sitting up, if they're just lying and staring at the ceiling, they don't develop cognition, speech, uh, all kinds of important visual things, and it's just not fair to them. So our goal is to make sure they have that opportunity. Uh, my name is Matthew Leback. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I got into kind of the, the maker movement as it relates to assistive technology a, a few years ago um, and kind of connected up with the ADAPT shop when we were seeking out um, better ways to create our own solutions. Um, we had, I work at a private day school and we have students that have uh, very specific uh, needs when it comes to AT um, and we found that creating those solutions was, was the best choice for them. Um, so this uh, the challenges and this, this event is really a uh, hits close to home for me because um, it helps, uh, you know, again, bring kind of two different groups together, right? Uh, your high school STEM STEM kids, you guys that have that maker uh, skill set and engineering background, um, and then the therapeutic side, like me and Janice, and people who get to work with our, our lovely students, our lovely children um, every day. So, a little bit about stuff. Okay, well, let's talk about our first scenario. Matthew is our first fictitious child. And I say fictitious because he's actually a composite of the some actual kids that I have seen over the years. And out of respect for the, their privacy, we're not going to use a real child. But these are real life, everyday issues that children we see are confronted with. So Matthew recently started preschool and he's now almost four years old. He was born with something called quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Quadriplegic means that all four limbs are affected, his arms and his legs, and cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder. It's caused by the brain injury or malformation that occurs when the child's brain is developing. That could be in utero, during birth, after birth, or in their early years. It is not a progressive disability, which means the injury itself is not going to grow or get worse. We'll see some children later who do have progressive injuries. In Matthew's case, the injury did not involve the intellectual part of his brain. He's actually very smart and already at four years old is reading. Most of the brain damage occurred in the motor area, so he has difficulties with his movement. This includes his mouth and tongue, so some people mistake his poor speech for poor cognition and think he doesn't understand them. As he grows, he will probably learn to express himself using a handheld communication device that will speak for him. So in school, he's trying to learn to write, but his hands have difficulty holding the pencil. So now we're trying to use a universal cuff with him. Matthew's muscles are strong, but his problem is that they're dominated by something called acetosis. 
This is also referred to as dyskinesia. These are involuntary, slow, writhing movements that get stronger with intention or effort. So the harder he tries to do something, the worse the dyskinesia. He gets very frustrated because his arms move spontaneously on their own and they fly around, they get in his way, they can hit his friends without meaning to, or spill his juice. How embarrassing is that? He tries hard to stop them by maybe tucking them under the table or even sitting on them or hiding them behind his back. At school, they have some bean bags and Velcro straps that he can use when he wants to keep his arms still. But the school is not allowed to, quote, restrain him. And they cannot tie down or limit his arms. Even if it would make it easier for him to paint, and even if he would like them to. So Matthew uses assistive technology to help him. He has a gait trainer to practice walking. And last year we made him a custom postural support chair, which is sometimes referred to as the happy chair because it makes you feel good when you sit in it. That chair helps him sit without squirming and in a nice upright posture. He really likes it. And he likes the lap tray because he can tuck his arm underneath it, and it doesn't push everything off the lap tray. He also is using a universal cuff to hold his pencil and his crayons for drawing. One of the goals of his therapy is to reduce unwanted arm movements so he can write better. We've used bean bags, and that works pretty good, but he's getting stronger. So we need something more. We would like to try a weighted exoskeleton, but they're pretty expensive and usually custom made. So we were hoping that you could design one that would be good for him. Then, of course, we would need a way to compare it to the current uh, beanbag or Velcro methods that we're using. Uh, we need to be able to measure how much control of the excess unwanted movement is occurring with the different instrument. So Matt, what do you think? Is that a fair challenge for them? I think it's a great challenge for them, Janice. <clears throat> so, um, the, the past two slides are just kind of uh, some references for you guys to utilize, uh, just some pictures and, and some definitions that you can refer back to um, when thinking about uh, the challenge and, and the best way to, to create um, this exoskeleton for Matthew. Um, we'll go into the... Uh, so this is your challenge. Um, again, like Janice mentioned, uh, she gave you kind of the, a lot of the why, um, and this is kind of the what, right? We we want to create a weighted exoskeleton based on Matthew's needs, that's your objective, um, with the goal of reducing unwanted arm motions um, so Matthew can work on handwriting and other kind of tabletop activities. Um, you guys get to do the how, right? Yeah, so your goal is to, to take the challenge, um, and it's going to be scored uh, on, the, on the three level system. So <clears throat> the levels are broken down, and, and they're kind of uh, at your choosing as far as what level you feel like you can accomplish. Um, the first one is just a concept phase. So in the, in the engineering field, the term slide word is used. So you're going to include a budget and, and a plan and a design. So that's, you, know, you guys can get as descriptive um, and as detailed as you want in this kind of concept phase. And if, if, you're, um, you know, if your team decides that that's kind of the, the highest level um, with equipment and skill base and um, the knowledge that you have, then that's the level that we will grade you on. Um, so again, you make that design and that plan as detailed and as specific as possible, um, and then we will grade you at a level one um, phase. If you go on and you want to actually create um, a stationary uh, exoskeleton, 
um, you know, whether it's with 3D printed materials, whether it's um, with scaffolding. Um, again, that the how is up to you guys to create. So that level two is is creating a, a design and building it um, with no IoT or no sensors present. Now you guys can utilize um, you know some some fake sensors or um, indicate whether it's with uh, styrofoam balls or, or post its on where you would place a sensor um, based on you know again if you had more time or or if you had um, kind of more of the engineering background to um, create uh, or connect those start the smart sensors. Moving on to level three um, is having a, a working functioning IoT sensor that's going to pull the the data. Um, that we're looking for for each scenario. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, these are kind of the, uh, the data points that we're looking to capture. Um, we got uh, motion of the hand while using an exoskeleton, uh, motion of the hand uh, versus tie downs, and then your control is um, motion of a hand with no tech. Um, so when you're developing and thinking about you know, your best sensors to use, um, these are kind of uh, the data sets that we're looking to, to capture and get to determine if an exoskeleton is the most viable choice um, for the challenge. All right, Janice, on to scenario two. Okay, our second fictitious child is Roger. Roger looks pretty typical for a four-year-old. He's always giggling and he thinks he's a pirate and he has his own personal pirate ship. Of course, we all know it's, it's his power wheelchair. Roger has a condition called muscular dystrophy. He was born with abnormal genes that interfere with the production of the proteins, and he needs these proteins to form healthy muscle. So even though there is medication and it can sometimes slow the progress, the muscles usually become weaker and weaker. This is why it's considered a progressive disorder. Back when Roger was 18 months old, he could stand with both hands held, but now someone lifts him up in and out of his wheelchair, and he depends on adults for most activities of daily living. He can move his legs a little, but not for any purposeful movement. And he can wiggle his fingers a little, but he can't make fists, and he can barely lift his hands up to his mouth. So think about it. That means a helper needs to feed him, scratch his nose, comb his hair, and everything else. On a slick surface powdered with cornstarch, we tested him, and he was able to reach forward eight inches all by himself. So that's his recent accomplishment. Roger's therapy goals are to gain strength, keep his flexibility, and be as independent as possible. However, Roger's personal goals are a little different. Roger loves playing video games with his brothers. In fact, he gets frustrated because at school, he's only allowed to play video games during recess. So, I wonder how many of you are driving yet. Well, when Roger was just two years old, he began driving a battery-powered wheelchair. And when he isn't in his wheelchair, he sits in a custom-made hospital support seat that we made at the adapt shop. He has a touch tablet, computer, computer and switch switches that he uses to play video games. games. And as Roger grows, he is definitely going to need an attendant to help him with some things. But with assistive technology, he can actually become very self-sufficient. Assistive technology will help him to turn on his TV, adjust the channel, open the doors, all kinds of things. So in therapy, he's beginning to try mobile arm supports. Now, we rig these up, and the goal is to eliminate the pull of gravity by allowing him to rest his arms. And we're using slings that are hanging from an overhead PVC framework. 
it's a bit primitive and it's a bit cumbersome, but it really does take the challenge out of reaching. It feels like if you're reaching underwater where no gravity is impeding you. In therapy, we're also exploring some different access methods to determine which one is best for him. Should he be using a mouse, voice activation, keyboard, switches? What's best for him? If you take on Roger's case, the challenge for you is to help me. We need to decide what assistive technology to recommend to Roger. Of course, in the end, remember, Roger himself will have something to say about the decision. And he should. After all, he is the one who will have to use it. So, Matt, can you help us explain some of the technical aspects that we're going to deal with? Yes, Janice, I would love to. Um, and I want to take this moment to uh, remember or remind everybody that if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them in the group chat box, and that way we can um, we can read them and, and make sure we get those answered uh, as best as possible for you guys. Um, going back to Roger and some of the technical aspects. Um, so access to his tablet is kind of our, our key focus here with Roger. Um, it allows him to interact with his brothers and also gives him that um, kind of gaming motivation for his uh, kind of leisure or play activities. Um, so when it comes to access, uh, direct access, so something you're able to, you know, we do it every day with the phone, right? If you're texting on your iPhone and you're using your fingers, that's a good example of a direct access. That's the quickest, that's your gold standard for access, right? We'd like everybody to have a direct access to their tablet, device, gaming system, anything, to, anything they're using um, in, in that regards. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is is switch use, and so you'll see switch use uh, dominated a lot in uh, with individuals with disability when it comes to access. Um, it, it serves a great purpose and some good function, but it's also a very slow access method. So when you're trying to uh, take Roger and have him play games with with his brothers, um, you want to make sure he's accessing his tablet or accessing those games as quickly as possible, so he's able to kind of keep up and make sure. Um, you know, he's, he's playing at their level. Oh. Um, so this, uh, again, are just kind of some examples of his current technology. Um, <clears throat> again, the, uh, the happy chair is his support, his support environment. Um, it, going back to kind of uh, when Janice is explaining the scenarios about getting them upright, getting them in a good support environment allows them to be in position to be as effective as possible. Um, in Roger's case, it's, it's playing his video games um, he's, he's very supportive in, in the happy chair, so it allows him to be as um, effective as possible when it comes to his, his you know, motor movements of the arms and hands. Um, the, his Bluetooth interfaces and his switches, again, are some pretty classic examples of how one would connect switches to an iPad. Um, there are games that are specifically made to interact with switches. Um, the iOS system does a great job of having accessibility features to where you can create custom input with switches to allow for a broader range of, of gameplay um, and use of an iPad when it comes to switches. But again, going back to kind of determining the best access method, um, switches are just always going to be a little bit slower um, than a direct select um, way of doing things. Um, but so again, going to our challenge, um, <clears throat> we would like you guys to create um, an ARM support system to kind of facilitate that direct asset access for Roger um, and using um, kind of the, the best way to create an arm sling system um, so he can interact with his, his tablet and his iPad as effectively as possible. Um, again, the objective is um, to create it based on Roger's needs and keeping his, his diagnosis in mind um, with the goal to support Roger's arms uh, while he plays video games with his brothers on his tablet. Um, again, the uh, level system for grading, right? And and we're going to hit this on each scenario, um, but that really is is kind of team specific. And you guys can come together as a team and, and see how ambitious you want to get um, and what you think is reasonable for for your team. Um, here's the IoT measurements for this scenario. Um, we want to measure the effectiveness of a direct access measure, so that's where your arm support system would come into play. Um, again, providing sensors and a way to measure. Um, the best way to uh, 
measure the arm support or arm movements um, when he's using his tablets within the arm support system. And then your control is going to be um, kind of what he's using already, so switches. Um, and then you can use that as kind of your baseline data and finding the best way to um, input sensor, uh, sensors um, and when it comes to switch use. So you can see which, which actually is the fastest method for Roger um, so he can keep up with, with playing with uh, his brothers and in the video game. All right, yes. Okay. Oh, number three. Our third child is Patricia. Patricia is about to celebrate her second birthday. Eight months ago, she was found at the bottom of a swimming pool and rushed to the hospital. She is what we call a near drowning victim. She suffered hypoxia. And what this means is that there was a lack of oxygen to her entire brain. What happens is that when you're not breathing, within minutes, there simply isn't enough oxygen left in your blood to fuel the cells of the brain. So they begin to die. And many areas of Patricia's brain were permanently damaged, including her motor cortex. And that's the area that's responsible for sending messages through the nerves out to the muscles, telling your body parts how to move and where to move and providing smooth, coordinated patterns of movement. We call this ability motor control. So in addition to poor motor control, Patricia has low muscle tone, and that's called hypotonicity. That means that her muscles are very limber and not very uh, quick to react. She's unable to sit by herself on the floor. She'll fall to the side or she'll slowly collapse forward till her face is on the ground. She needs to sit up so that she can interact with the world around her and see what's going on. So at the Adapt Shop, we designed and built her a personal support seat. It is custom designed to help hold her up with good trunk alignment. We also added some ability for the whole seat to tilt back so that we could balance the weight of her head over her trunk so that it won't fall forward or backwards. She, unfortunately, she can't do that for very long. So she has a head support on her chair that she can rest her head on. This type of seating allows her to look at books and listen to her family read to her. And she really likes that interaction. But here's the problem. She still tires really quickly and her head falls, usually forward, all the way down to her chest. So the seat is tilted back. But now she's facing the ceiling. She can't see her books. She can't engage with her parents. She can't even see what's around her. All she sees is the light on the ceiling. So her therapy goal is to get strong enough to hold her head up by herself so she can face forward and maybe even start to look around. It's been slow, but Patricia is getting stronger. She does floor activities and tummy time where she has to look up and strengthen her upper back and neck. The family and team are thinking that maybe a device might help. This is where you guys come in. We would like to be able to help her learn to keep her head up while she's in her seat. Maybe you could design something. And then, of course, we would also need to get some feedback so that she knows when her head is there in the right position and maybe encourage her to hold in that position. And as always, we need to get some measure of her progress to show that she is indeed improving by using this device. So, Matt, do you think that's too tough, or is that a fair description? I think that's very fair. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's a great description of 
of this scenario. Um, so again, uh, this is a good scenario because really the one piece of uh, assistive technology we're working with is the happy chair itself, right? So we have um, a lot of room to be um, as creative as possible when we're, when we're thinking about her therapy goal of uh, increasing her ability to keep her head upright. So um, if you go one slide down, perfect. Um, and this picture here, it's a good visual of kind of seeing where her eye angles are. And again, like Janice mentioned, um, you know, with her ability to kind of uh, require that head support, um, she is pretty much looking at the ceiling a lot of times. So again, that, that ties into her goal of trying to keep her head um, upright so she can be more involved in the environment um, and create that kind of eye contact and, and have that uh, strength to keep her head up um, to interact with people and, and preferred items. Um, your objective in this one is to create a head support system that allows Patricia to work on keeping her head upright. Um, and then the goal is to increase her visual engagement with preferred items, which could be family members, which could be a you know, device or tablet, which could be uh, just toys in front of her. Um, again, that the big goal here is to keep get those eyes um, from looking up at the ceiling to a more kind of horizontal plane so she can kind of survey her environment more effectively. Um, again, with our levels, um, again, it's up to your team to decide uh, what level uh, you deem is uh, appropriate for your team, um, and then we will grade you accordingly to those levels. Um, for our IoT inputs, um, one of the, the data we'd like to see is how long um, she's able to hold her head in a certain plane um, while in that seat. That gives us good input to see if she's progressing, um, whether it's a motivating item that gets her head up a little bit longer, uh, preferred family member, um, what we can use in our therapies to help her kind of strengthen that head control. Um, another uh, sensory data we look for is if it's a head's in the correct position um, and or when her head's in the correct position um, and measuring kind of the angle of the chair or um, in regards to her seating environment with the happy chair, uh, when her head's in a good position and how we can kind of keep that head um, in that position for as long as possible. Um, and then your control is measuring the head position and time um, <clears throat> it's in position without the custom seat. So you can look at um, her outside of the seat and, and really uh, see how those, that data is different um, from when she's supported in, in the happy chair versus when she's out of the happy chair. So, so that wraps up the, the three challenges, Janice. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, please um, put them in the group chat. And David will fill you in some more. All right, so it looks like we currently don't have any questions in the group chat. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just move on to the next uh, portions. And again, feel free to type those in as I'm talking, and we can circle back to them at the very end. Um, so hopefully we've just been so informative that you guys uh, know exactly uh, how to get started. Um, I'm sure you guys will have questions along the way as well. So I'll have my info on there at the end um, as a contact point. All of your coaches should also already have contact info for myself as well as Amy. Um, and very nice. Okay, so last couple of things as we're finishing up. I'm sure you guys are all wondering how you're going to be judged. Um, so we've got the judging rubric on the screen here. And, you know, one of the first most important things as you get into this is going to be the cost to implement. Um, we are a nonprofit, so we're always, you know, going to make sure that the solution to fit the child um, is cost effective because we do fundraise for those costs. Um, also, creativity, very important. Uh, build quality, that would be if you get to level two and three. And what I want to spend the most time on here is the IoT stack. This was actually brought to us by Kurt Cornum, um, and this is something that um, they use when they're developing technology in the real world. And this is basically, um, these build on each other. You know, effective use of sensors, connectivity method, what can be done with the data? You know, is it just useless information that isn't practical? Um, data visualization, how are you going to present that data so that it can tell a compelling story and actually inform decision making? And then also the physical packaging. You know, if you come up with a 
RoboCop style exoskeleton that d- requires a battery the size of a truck. Um, obviously, not super uh, effective or efficient. So just kind of keeping in mind that the aesthetics of the build are important as well um, and the size. And so that last one, um, you know, I wouldn't expect you guys to have, you know, custom molded um, designs and casings for this equipment at this point. But that is something that we want you to keep in mind as if you were to develop this um, long term uh, in in a bigger way, that is something that's going to be important. It's also important to look at the stack and realize that you can knock this stack out of the park at level one. So, you know, if you don't think you're going to be able to build it or get the connectivity in IoT, you can focus all of your energy on these items um, and do a great job and give us something useful to work with. Um, so again, we got Q&A here too. I also wanted to run by a few things that you guys have already received, um, the timeline for the challenge. Obviously, today is the official kickoff. You've had the scenario, so you might have already started thinking about solutions, what you want to do. That's great. Um, this first week is obviously uh, narrowing down that solution. And then also, ideally, submitting a bill of materials to us. It will send you guys some more information about this on Monday. And I had a few people question, like, why would you have a $100 registration fee? And then we mm-hmm. give you $100 of materials. Um, originally, we were planning to provide all of the materials that you would need to do your build to you. But as we started to build, develop the challenge, we realized that that is something that might pigeonhole you um, specifically towards one solution that might not be the best. So we could have provided you um, materials up front, but we didn't want it to be to a point where you are basically just assembling the kit that you got. So we kind of had that change in the last three, four weeks. So if there's any confusion about um, how that works, that's the reason for it. So we are going to ask you to, as you work on that solution, to submit a bill of materials to us. Again, I'll send you all that information on Monday. And then we will order and deliver those pieces to you. Um, Ideally, that happens in the first week or two so that then you also have time to create and assemble. But if it happens in week three, that's totally fine. If you just are focusing on winning at level one and you never submit a bill of materials to actually be fulfilled, um, that's fine as well. You've got all of the options. And again, if there's any confusion on this, um, I'll be available to answer additional questions. So the schedule, week one, Bill of Materials is your focus. Week two, we'll be scheduling calls with mentors um, from Intel IoT division, as well as Janice, who you heard from today. Um, Matt's going to be answering additional questions uh, via email to make sure that you guys are able to move forward. So we'll have those mentor calls scheduled in week two, as well as week three. In week four, we're going to ask you to submit Um, your first uh, written piece um, on that Thursday before the event on Saturday. So this is going to be your first chance to impress the judges with your idea. It's going to give the judges time to get uh, a concept of what you are working towards so that they are ready to hear your full presentation on that Saturday and will have questions um, ready and they'll have an idea of what you're up to. So it basically gives them hours to understand your concept and build um, versus the minutes that you'll be pitching. Speaking of the minutes you'll be pitching, on that Saturday, 1013 at Burton Bar Library, the presentation is going to be uh, Shark Tank style. Um, a lot of uh, startup grind um, and seed spot use this when uh, people are pitching their ideas as well. So basically, you'll have five to six minutes to be on stage and do a formal presentation to the judges who will be sitting right in front of you. They will then have a second to collect their thoughts and ask you a couple of questions that have been on their minds. And then you'll be able to respond directly to the judges. They'll do the scoring immediately after those questions have been answered. And then we'll do, um, we'll tally up all of the results immediately and announce a, min, a winner uh, you know, 10 to 15 minutes after the last team goes off the stage. Um, and again, 
I'm sure we'll be emailing you much more information about that. So if you have questions, please let us know. So the page on your screen here, um, this is me. I'm David Reno. I am not very knowledgeable about any of this. I don't know STEM, I don't know assistive technology, but I know a lot of people who do. So any event related questions, um, email those to me or give me a call. I'll get back to you same day with answers. For technical questions about the build, um, I will receive those and I will get them to our mentors, to Matt, to Janice. Um, so just don't expect to call me asking questions about Arduino. Um, it will waste your time. So I don't want that to happen. Um, very nice. Um, Amy, did any questions pop up? No. Okay. Very nice. Okay. So um, in conclusion, the winner will be receiving $500, which is mm -hmm. great. The big prize that they're going to get, though, is um, receiving additional support to develop their solution. Again, ideally, we get an idea out of this that we can implement with children. So that support, um, it can be a combination of working with our Intel mentors, working with our team here at Southwest Human Development. Um, there's a lot of resources that we have, even at ASU, has expressed a lot of interest in bioscience division. Um, so that's really going to be the most um, important thing that you guys are working towards is to get to work alongside some Intel, inside ASU, um, and our team here. So um, thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you to all of our sponsors. I did also want to call out Intel. Uh, Brian McCarson, their chief technology officer, has been on the committee, and their IoT division has helped out a lot with these challenges and are providing the bulk of the mentors. Um, the Arizona SciTech Festival has been very helpful as well. And their kickoff event is on October 3rd at the Mesa Art Center. And we will actually be presenting a session about this challenge. So we'll be in week three at that point. But we would love to have anybody come out and even bring your build uh, where you're at at that point. Um, and we'll be sharing with the, the folks there about the challenge, what we've learned about the system technology, um, and more. So um, October 3rd, we'll get that in the email to you too. So thank you everybody for coming. We will close uh, the session right now and then this will be available um, via recording as well. So thank you everybody.